Well, Dr John Blaxland is an expert on military history, intelligence, security and Asia-Pacific affairs. He's with the Australian National University's Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. And he's with us now, live from Canberra. Dr Blaxland, thanks very much for your time. My pleasure, Scott. Before you were a writer and academic, you were a long-serving member of the uh, Defence Force. Give us an insight from a military perspective. What's the mood and reaction like amid all the ranks at the time of just before and at the release of a white paper like this? There's certainly expectation. Uh, there's certainly a bit of concern about what it will and won't include. But my sense is that in this case, there's more continuity than change. So I think uh, overall people should have uh, cautious optimism about this case. Um, certainly what we're seeing is in the environment we face today, um, there is the certainty of uncertainty. And that I think is one of the reasons why people feel a little bit concerned about the, the budget cutbacks, the fact that there isn't hard and fast commitments to uh, budgetary increases and or going back to where we were a couple of years ago. And I guess there's a concern also about the fluctuation of defence budgets. If we recall in the 2009 Defence White Paper, it articulated a pretty bold vision of where it wanted the Defence Force to go. And there was a financial plan, but as soon as the ink was dry, the government was cutting away the budgets. This time the government hasn't even committed to that. So there are concerns that, yes, OK, it's a pretty robust plan on many levels, but where's the money going to be? It's, it's not a magic pudding. There are real concerns that uh, we can stretch out the plan about subs, about uh, uh, ship acquisition and development plans uh, to the never-never uh, and uh, actually not come up with something robust to, to work with. And as I say, there are real concerns about the uncertainty in the region. So, John, if the detail's missing, particularly details in regard to costings, how this bold vision will be paid for, Therefore, then, as a roadmap for outlining where the military is headed and where Australia's strategic interests lie now and into the future, what's the point of it? I oh, know it's still a very useful document in articulating the direction of the ship of state when it comes to the defence of the nation. That's a very constructive thing to do. And as I say, look, it's on balance, it's a pretty good document. I just hope that the government will have the courage to follow through in, in actually not taking any more money away and where possible, and as soon as reasonable, uh, addition, uh, putting money back in, because there's been several billion dollars cut out of it in the last few years. And that's on top of a strategic reform program that was supposed to save $20 billion over a decade. So Defence, yes, it's a big organisation, but it's gone through significant cuts. It's gone through a number of so-called reforms, uh, and uh, one has to caution where we're heading next, especially given the lack of detail. In regard to China and the language used this time around compared to 2009, what's your reading into it in regard to Australia's relationship with China or change within China in regard to its policies pertaining to its strategic interests? What has changed apart from the words? Well, the words mean everything. Uh, perception is reality. Uh, and the words are significant because they redefine the landscape in a much more constructive manner, I would argue. This is a disarming uh, document that talks about building trust, building security. This is a constructive way for what a middle power like Australia to behave in its region and in its environment. Reaching out both to China, to the United States, reaffirming the United States about its commitments, reaffirming the region about its desire to continue and deepen its engagement, and also reaching out to China about seeing this having a, a creative tension, if you like, that this is not a zero-sum game. It doesn't have to be painted that way. It's actually completely unhelpful to paint it that way. So my sense is that this is actually pretty good from that point of view. It's a constructive document pointing us in the right direction. John Wilde, there has been a lot of focus on that relationship, that triangular relationship of China, ourselves and the US and where we lie between. What about for the other key players in the region, such as Indonesia, such as uh, Malaysia, these key players, how will they read what our future, how we see our future from this white paper in regard to our reactions and interactions with them? 
My sense is they'll be cautiously optimistic. This is a far less confronting document than the 2009 one, a much more inclusive one as well. And it's interesting as we reflect on the new amphibia ships that are coming online in the next couple of years, they actually open up opportunities for bilateral and multilateral engagement as equals between Australia and Indonesia and beyond with Malaysia, Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries and countries of the Pacific. This is, uh, this is something I think they will come to recognise as in their interests as well. Uh, and it's not overstated. It's not uh, uh, unduly grandiose. Um, uh, this is, as I say, it's something that uh, the region can buy. It's also interesting to reflect as we sh shift away from the focus on the Middle East and we shift back to the so-called Indo-Pacific, which I think is a very healthy rejigging of the title, placing Southeast Asia right in the middle of Australia's strategic calculus for engagement in the region. So these countries are very important. The way the words, the words are put in the, in the Defence White Paper, it's, it's, it's uh, respectful, it's constructive, uh, it's positive. Dr John Blackslin from the ANU, thanks for sharing your perspective with us this afternoon. Much Pleasure. appreciated. Thank you.